In April 2011, police received a desperate 999 call reporting a house fire on Georgia Drive in Nottingham, England. Two young boys had fled the house with a family dog, Meg, and could do nothing but watch as the fire tore through their home, with their mother inside. Emergency services quickly arrived on the scene and desperately battled to put out the blaze. Neighbors watched in horror as the usually quiet street had turned into a scene from their worst nightmare. The media quickly picked up on the story and reporters arrived to cover the heroic rescue the boys had made of themselves. After the blaze was under control, investigators entered the home to try and figure out what had started it, and it didn't take them long. The source of the fire was quickly discovered to have been centered around a charred body lying on the bedroom floor. Investigators were tasked with figuring out exactly what had transpired. The older of the two children who lived at the house, who was only 14 years old, told the detectives a terrifying story about what he had witnessed the night before. Daniel Bartlam told authorities a tale of how when he woke up in the middle of the night, needing to use the bathroom, he came face to face with a masked hammer-wielding man. Daniel said that the man threw his weapon at him before fleeing the home. Coming to, Daniel said that he went into his mother's bedroom to raise the alarm when he realized she was lying face down on the floor and a fire was erupting around her. Daniel told investigators how he bravely saved his brother and his dog and alerted the police once they had reached safety. A touching story of a heroic 14-year-old boy. That's all it ever was, a story. The truth is much, much worse than that. Due to the extent of the fire, the badly burned body was unable to be identified in a conventional way. Dental records were used in order to identify the victim. 47-year-old mother of two, Jacqueline Barlam, better known as Jackie, the results of her post-mortem and the police and fire investigation showed that the fire was started deliberately in an attempt to hide the manner in which she died. Blunt force trauma caused by multiple blows to her head. Jackie's partner, Simon Matas, was not with her at the time and found out the horrifying truth on the news. He dashed back, unaware of the full details of what had occurred. As word of what had occurred that night spread, people began to learn more about the victim of this heinous attack. The full picture of what had happened wouldn't come to light until a name suppression order was lifted, allowing the press to name the alleged killer and give details on what had happened. This had been a meticulously planned and orchestrated murder. Jackie Barlam was a loving mother. She gave birth to her first son, Daniel, with her partner, Adrian, in 1996. The couple married three years later and later had a second son together, Dominic. The two boys grew up in middle-class suburbia, a large detached home in a good neighborhood Daniel had the privilege, not many do, of attending a prestigious local private school, Greenholm, Linton, and then Dagfa School, Beeston. However, the fairy tale of life came crashing down, and Jackie and Adrian split a few years after their second son was born. Daniel and his brother went to live with Jackie after the couple divorced and sold their marital home. Due to now finding herself relying on a single income, Jackie could no longer afford the privileges Daniel had become so accustomed to. He was pulled out of private school and sent to Christ the King School, Arnold, a local public school close to their new home. Trouble began soon after. Daniel felt like his life had been flipped upside down, shunned by his peers and grieved the loss of his former life. He argued with his mother and brother constantly and felt abandoned by his father. To add fuel to the fire, Jackie had begun dating a new man, Simon Mattis, and the couple was considering moving in together. During this time, he became obsessed with fictional gore and violence watching disturbing content over and over. As he retreated further and further into his dark world of fictional violence, he became more reclusive. He would spend the majority of his time in his bedroom, isolated, feeding into his obsessions, watching a collection of horror films, including Saw and Nightmare on Elm Street. Simon believed that Daniel's behavior was just him acting out. The couple had told Jackie's children that they were considering buying a home together and selling their respective properties. Daniel felt like his life was about to flip again for the worse. He wasn't interested in having another man around the house. Nobody could fill the void his father had left. When Jackie tried to discipline her son, he would often become violent in an attempt to regain control. And on more than one occasion, Simon had to intervene to protect Jackie from Daniel. In 2010, Jackie was so shaken and scared by her son's outburst that it left her injured and him roaming the streets that she reported him to the police. He was picked up by authorities late into the night walking back to his old home. From then on, Daniel's behavior only worsened. He had been referred for counseling following outbursts at school and during his sessions would speak about hearing voices and how the voices were telling him to hurt people. Daniel spoke about visions he was having of killing people and he also spoke about how his school tie, which he had named Fred, 
had taken on a life of its own and was attempting to strangle him. Daniel's alarming behavior was only worsening. Simon would catch Daniel stealing his mother's underwear on multiple occasions. On another occasion, Simon caught Daniel filming him whilst he was getting dressed in his room. I asked him what he was playing at, but he just shrunk away. It was then that I noticed the number of horror films he had on the shelves. There was the Halloween trilogy and Saw among the films and DVDs. I confronted Jackie about my concerns, but she just laughed it off. I didn't want to push it too much because he was not my son, but I was worried. He would also spend hours writing stories, violent stories using aliases, but with himself as the protagonist. Other stories Daniel wrote involved him being the most famous soap opera star who had ever lived and had been on a soap for 50 years, highlighting his desire for either fame or infamy. He also became fascinated with British soap operas and their more darker storylines. Daniel's favorite shows were Emmerdale and Coronation Street, with one character in particular becoming a deep obsession. The character of John Stape was a regular on Coronation Street from 2007 until 2011, when he was killed off. During the character's life on the cobbles, as the soap is affectionately referred to, Stape became one of the show's key villains. He had several storylines involving kidnapping and murder, one of which Daniel would watch over and over. In the soap, Stape had murdered a woman with a hammer and then left her body in the wreckage of a tram crash so his crime wouldn't be discovered. Six weeks before the death of Jackie Barlow, a mental health assessment was conducted for Daniel, the result that he demonstrated no mental illness and posed little or no risk. A devastating assessment in hindsight. By April 2011, the relationship between Jackie and Daniel had continued to break down and had now reached an all-time low with him lashing out at her every hour of the day in front of his brother and Simon. He was still infatuated with violent media and directed much of his wrath against his mother. Turning to the outlet he knew best, Daniel began to write out his violent fantasies on his computer. He created a script, one of which he covertly planned to bring to life. On April 25th, Easter Sunday, 2011, everything appeared to be normal in the Bartlam household. Daniel had spent the night before eating Easter eggs and watching more violent films, the usual choice. Simon had texted Jackie that everything was fine and that Daniel had plans to go out with his grandparents after dropping off the family dog for grooming. It wasn't until late, late into the night, that he would carry out his sinister plan. He played out a script he had prepared on his computer about a young boy named Daniel Bartlam who had murdered his mother. With a claw hammer, Bartlam beat his mother seven times on the head and face as she lay in bed. He then rolled her body onto the floor wrapped it in a newspaper, doused it with gasoline, and lit it on fire. A lump hammer was left nearby by Bartlam, making it appear as if it had been discarded by an intruder who had escaped through the window. He then wiped the weapon he'd used with cleaning fluid and stashed it in his bedroom before fleeing the burning house with his brother and dog. Just like he had written in his screenplay, Daniel began claiming that the attack had been carried out by an intruder. Even before the police arrived, Daniel began lying to those around him, when Simon heard of the tragedy on the news, he said, I could not get through to Jackie, I didn't panic, but then I saw a picture of the home and my heart sank. I was just numb. Then I learned that a 14-year-old boy had been arrested and in the back of my mind I thought, Daniel. Forensics were able to find many pieces of evidence that pointed the fingers solely in his direction. When authorities went into the home to search, they found two hammers. One was a claw hammer, which following an examination was proven to be the murder weapon. The other hammer was a lump hammer that had been planted to act as a red herring and throw the investigators off the scent. According to former Detective Chief Inspector Colin Sutton, who worked with the Metropolitan Police Force, the degree of planning that he had exhibited from planning the murder to setting the fire using a decoy weapon and adamantly sticking to his story demonstrated a determination not usually seen in a 14-year-old boy who had committed such a serious offense. Despite Daniel's best attempts, the investigators soon learned the truth. Even though the house was damaged by the fire, in an attempt to cover any trace of his crime, a post-mortem examination showed Jackie died from head injuries. Authorities were able to collect Daniel's computer. What they discovered left no doubt about who was to blame. Daniel's internet history indicated his fascination with fictitious killers. Video clips of John Stape, the villain from Coronation Street, were also on his hard drive. When his information became public, Daniel became known as the Coronation Street Killer. Worst of all, when examining his laptop, officers found even more disturbing evidence. Whilst he had deleted it from his computer days before the murder, officers were able to recover the story that Daniel had written. 
The story he based his crime on was a fictional version of himself as the central character. In the script, Daniel was a master criminal who got away with a string of gruesome murders, rapes, and assaults. Also in the story, he bludgeoned his mother to death with a hammer before setting fire to the body in order to make it look like an intruder had done it. To top off the mountain of evidence against him, the murder weapon was found in his bedroom. After days of interviews, Daniel finally broke down when he was presented with all of the evidence against him. He admitted to killing his mother and proceeded to tell the police an entirely different version of events on the day of the murder than he had previously told. Daniel admitted to investigators that on the day of the fire, he had argued with his mother. At around 1 a.m., he stormed into her bedroom and they had a blazing row about a pair of trainers that he couldn't find. He said Jackie had called him a weirdo and turned to go back to bed. Not able to drop it, he said he then returned with a hammer and beat her to death. The notion that this had been a spur-of-the-moment attack didn't match with what officers had found. This was no sudden rage killing. His script showed that this was a planned and thought-out murder that had been meticulously plotted. When trying to ascertain exactly why Daniel had committed the offense, Professor Francesca Happ, a neuroscientist, said in the documentary about the case that people with psychopathic tendencies don't have the same breaks in their behavior that other people do, such as seeing someone in distress and that while this isn't a motivation to do harm, people with psychopathy don't stop doing harm. She also mentioned that because children's brains are continually developing throughout infancy and adolescence, establishing whether or not a child has psychopathy is extremely difficult. But it is evident that individuals with a lot of psychopathic tendencies usually display them when they are much younger. A criminal psychologist, Professor Craig Jackson, advised that he could see plausible links between the kind of extreme aggression exhibited by Daniel Bartlem, though still extremely rare, and the phenomenal expansion of realistic stylized and simulated screen violence that is intrinsic to plots or gameplay, be it in video games, films, or on television. Experts argued between the cause of his crime being rooted in the content he consumed and the nature of his family life. Professor Kevin Brown, a forensic psychologist, weighed in, saying, In a crime as violent as his, one would expect to see a history of abuse and neglect. But this did not appear to be present in his case. The only thing that appeared to traumatize him was his parents' divorce. There was no logical motive for what Daniel had done. On October 4, 2011, Daniel Bartlam entered a not guilty plea, claiming he had been provoked before his trial began. Daniel Barlam was examined by mental health experts who found that he had cluster B personality traits, antisocial, borderline, and narcissistic. They also found that Daniel displayed attention-seeking tendencies, was manipulative, and awkward behind closed doors, but in public, he acted entirely normal. Daniel was one of the rare exceptions to the rule that personality disorders aren't normally identified in people under the age of 18. Daniel was deemed as having antisocial and borderline personality disorders, as well as schizotypal and narcissistic characteristics. Daniel Bartlam's trial began on January 23, 2012, at Nottingham Crown Court. It was now up to the Crown Prosecution Services to prove that he had killed his mother and had pre-planned the attack in order to be found guilty of the murder. The case was unprecedented, and few had ever followed a case of such savagery perpetrated by someone so young against a family member. It was particularly exceptional because of the level of the forethought that Daniel had showed leading up to the murder. The court heard that Bartlam was preoccupied with how to get away with violent crimes and had created a script that mapped out what transpired that night during his cross-examination by the prosecution. Journalist Rebecca Shirley, who was reporting on and covering the trial, claimed that when she first saw Daniel in the dock, she was astonished at how young he appeared. She also described him as sitting quietly in the dark. But when he was cross-examined after giving evidence, he became arrogant and gave as good as he got. He would frequently bury his head in his hands, but not out of remorse or humiliation, but rather to see who was observing him through his hands. There were no tears, no regret, and it appeared like Daniel was entirely uninterested and couldn't be bothered to pay attention. Daniel's barrister had asked if he had planned on killing his mother, to which he replied, I didn't plan to kill her at that time. In court, the jury heard that Daniel had immersed himself in a fantasy world, and the boundaries between his fictional and real lives had become tragically blurred. He told the courts that in the story, he got away with it, and he thought he could get away with it in real life too. Given the overwhelming evidence, Daniel realized denying what he'd done was pointless. Instead, he claimed that his mother's physical and verbal abuse had driven him to kill. However, this was not a very successful defense. 
Jackie was regarded to be a very kind-natured woman, and no witnesses had ever seen her abuse any of her children. After a two-week trial, Daniel Barlam was unanimously found guilty by the jury of the murder of Jackie Barlam. Mr. Justice Julian Flo, who presided over the trial, stated, While there were clearly arguments between you and your mother, which are not uncommon between mothers and their teenage children, I am quite satisfied that there was no physical or verbal abuse by your mother, as you alleged in your evidence at trial. He also stated, It was a grotesque and senseless killing. The circumstances of this crime are both shocking and difficult to comprehend. We now know that Daniel Bartland planned to murder his mother, carried out the murder in a violent attack on her, and then attempted to cover it up by both burning her body and lying consistently throughout the police investigation. It was only after speaking with other witnesses that we realized his account was not consistent, and he was then arrested. Flo also decided to lift the reporting restrictions after being unanimously convicted and sentenced. The decision in this case, to lift the anonymity on Daniel's identity and release his name and details of his crime to the public, despite his young age, allowed the press to report on exactly what had happened. The investigation's lead detective, Chief Inspector Kate Maynard, stated she had never seen anything like it. Daniel has lied repeatedly throughout, attempting to discredit Jacqueline's character. Perhaps one day, he will tell the truth as there are several witnesses. Daniel's attempts to portray her as a bad mother would not be further from the truth. According to her parents, who described her as a wonderful, loving, and caring woman, who would always be there to help if anyone was in trouble. The family said in a statement that they were still struggling to come to terms with what Daniel had done, adding that there are no winners here, because not only have we lost Jackie, but we have also lost Daniel. Jackie's partner said, I don't believe he can be rehabilitated with what he did because of the horrific nature of it and the way he was so manipulative. My only fear is that he will have manipulated the parole board and pretended he's better. I don't fear him. The truth about what happened that night may never be known because only one person alive knows the truth, and that person is Daniel Bartlam. What we do know is that those who knew and loved Jackie are determined that she'll be remembered as a kind mother and wife, not for the tragic and appalling manner in which her life was snatched. Daniel was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 16 years. He is now 25 years old and still behind bars. He will not be eligible for parole until 2027.